Picture this, white sandy beaches, that crystal clear blue water, you know, the perfect tropical escape. Yeah, places like the Caribbean, parts of Mexico, Florida, they've always been that ideal. Amazing marine life, coral reefs, mangroves. Just beautiful spots for sailing, snorkeling, relaxing. Absolutely. But um, since around 2011, that picture's been, well, threatened by what one source actually calls a 20-ton sea menace. That's quite a phrase. So today, in our deep dive, we're looking into the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, the GASB. Right. We'll unpack what this sargassum stuff actually is, why there's suddenly so much of it. And its effects, right? The environmental impact, economic, health, and what, if anything, can be done about it. It's being called the planet's biggest, most harmful algal bloom. Exactly. And the interesting thing is sargassum itself isn't new. It's this brown, floating seaweed uh, macroalgae. Pelagic, meaning it just floats out in the open ocean. Precisely. And historically, it was a good thing. Oh. Healthy amounts lived in the Sargasso Sea, this huge area in the North Atlantic. People called it the golden rainforest, didn't they? Supported whales, turtles, tuna. Yeah, it was a vital protected ecosystem. Yeah. But then 2011 happened. That's when NASA satellites picked up this just massive explosion of sargassum. But not in the Sargasso Sea. No, that's the key. It was in a totally new area further south. And that formed this this great Atlantic sargassum belt. Okay, so how big are we talking? We're talking over 5,000 miles long, stretching from West Africa, across the Atlantic, through the Caribbean, and right into the Gulf of Mexico. 5,000 miles. And during peak months, it can hold, on average, something like 20 million tons of this seaweed. 20 million tons. So yeah. why? What's feeding this massive growth? Well, the sources point to a few big things. One is a huge increase in nutrients washing into the ocean. From where? Like agriculture? Exactly. Runoff from big rivers, the Amazon, the Congo, the Mississippi. They're carrying fertilizers and other nutrients into the sea. Plus, dust blowing off the Sahara Desert. Sarin dust. Yeah, it contains nutrients too. And then there's upwelling nutrient-rich water coming up from the deep ocean. Okay, so more food for the algae. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Changes in ocean currents and wind patterns seem to be pushing it around differently. And... Uh, Climate change is definitely a factor. More sunlight, warmer water, perfect uh, yeah. growing conditions. Pretty much. Faster growth, bigger blooms. Which leads to the impacts. Ecologically, what does this, this giant raft of seaweed do? Well, out at sea, it can actually interfere with migrations. Like in Barbados, they've seen fewer flying fish, but more young dolphin fish and small lobsters showing up where they wouldn't normally be. It kind of reroutes things. Hmm. But the real problems start when it gets near shore or washes up. That's where it gets really damaging. These thick mats, they block sunlight from reaching down. So bad news for coral reefs and seagrass? Devastating. Mm -hmm. Corals, seagrasses, mangroves, they all need that light. These are critical habitats, you know. They protect coastlines, store carbon. And when it lands on the beach, I hear it starts to rot pretty fast. Within about 48 hours. And as it decomposes, it changes the water chemistry, the pH. It sucks oxygen out of the water, creating these dead zones. Suffocating marine life. Exactly. And Dr. Brian LaPointe points out this really stresses corals, leads to bleaching. And I read it's terrible for sea turtles, too. Oh, absolutely catastrophic. Six out of seven endangered species are in this region. Nesting females might have to swim miles past sargassum piles to find a clean beach. And the nests themselves. At risk from cleanup machinery. Hmm. Plus, the decomposing seaweed generates heat which can actually change the sex of the hatchlings in the eggs. Change their sex? Wow. Yeah. And if they do hatch, the little ones can get trapped, disoriented, or exposed trying to cross these huge mounds to reach the sea. It sounds like a nightmare. What about um, human health impacts? Disposal seems tricky. Very tricky. At sea, it absorbs CO2, but also heavy metals like lead, arsenic. So what happens when it's collected? Often it gets dumped in landfills, deep ones. And there's a real concern these toxins could leach into groundwater. Dr. LaPointe had that scarp quote, they have literally taken the beach to the dump. Yikes. And the cleanup itself causes problems. Right. Heavy machinery damages the beaches, causes erosion, makes coastal flooding worse. And the smell? I've heard about the smell. Oh, it's infamous. Hydrogen sulfide, rotten eggs, Oops. plus ammonia, methane. It's not just unpleasant, it causes real health issues. Like what? Headaches, nausea, breathing problems, difficulty concentrating. Yeah. Dr. Debor Razier even warns about potential long-term cardiovascular, eye, and uh, neurocognitive problems from prolonged exposure. So it's more than just an inconvenience. Much more. People report stress, insomnia. Mm -hmm. It even corrodes metal. 
appliances, jewelry. Just imagine the scale. You mentioned Cancun in 2015. Yeah, 5,000 workers, over 1,000 truckloads of seaweed from 100 miles of beach. Just one effort. The economic cost must be enormous, yeah. especially for tourism-dependent regions. It's potentially crippling. Hillary Beckles called it the greatest single threat to the Caribbean economy I can imagine. And the Caribbean relies heavily on tourism, right? Hugely. It's the most tourism-dependent region globally. We're talking billions of dollars at stake. $37.5 billion in 2022 alone. This sargassum threatens that entire lifeline. And what about local fishing communities? They're hit hard, too. Fewer fishing days, different types of fish being caught, difficulty even getting boats through the thick mats, plus damage to engines and gear. It's a huge financial strain. So it's this massive, complex problem. Is anyone finding solutions in this? You called it a sea of confusion. There's a lot of research happening. Yeah. And private companies are getting involved. People are trying different things. Like what? Well, collecting it at sea is one idea before it hits the beaches. Mm. That avoids a lot of the onshore problems. Makes sense. Careful hand removal from beaches is another approach. Slower, maybe, but less damaging than machines. And it creates jobs. Any high-tech ideas? Some talk about sinking it deep in the ocean after removing nutrients, maybe sequestering carbon that way but the long-term effects aren't really known. And then there's valorization. Valorization, making it valuable. Exactly. Finding ways to use it, biofuel, bioplastics, fertilizer, maybe even construction materials like bricks or paper, turning a problem into a resource. That sounds promising. Is there any way to predict when these huge influxes are coming? Yes. Thankfully, there's the Sargassum Warning System, SAWS. Dr. Chuanman Hu developed it using NASA satellite data. It helps communities prepare. That's crucial. So it seems like this isn't just a local issue. Absolutely not. It's global. It's geopolitical, involving countries across continents. And experts agree the GA speed probably isn't going away. So we need ongoing innovation funding. Yes, and collaboration. It affects at least seven UN Sustainable Development Goals. Governments, tourism, scientists, environmental groups, local people, everyone needs to be involved. It really highlights the sheer scale, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Affecting ecology, health, economies across such a vast area. It really does. Mm. And it brings us back to that powerful idea from the sources. Which was? Ultimately, we are one interconnected and interdependent global community, and therefore a menace to one is a menace to all. A menace to one is a menace to all. That really makes you think, doesn't it? What does that interconnectedness mean when facing something like this? And what role could we all play in finding solutions?